Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Thank you for joining us for another installment of our series, Understanding Our New World. And we're privileged today to be joined by the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, Juliana Stratton, the 48th Gov Lieutenant Governor of Illinois. Um, the Lieutenant Governor is from Chicago, uh, grew up there, very active in her community, went to the University of Illinois Champaign, uh, went to DePaul University Law School, continued to be very active in her community, ran for the General Assembly and won, was serving a very productive first term in which uh, Democratic candidate by the name of Jay Pritzker uh, asked her to be his running mate. And of course they ran successfully and won in the 2018 election. And both uh, the governor and the Lieutenant Governor were sworn in in January of 2019. So Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's my honor. I, I might start. I was talking to Sheila Simon, who is our in-house expert on Lieutenant Governors. And she teased me. She said, you can call her either Lieutenant Governor Stratton or Governor Stratton, but do not call her Lieutenant Stratton. She said that's a, she, she said that's a protocol that Lieutenant Governors uh, adhere to as best they can. So Yeah, although I hear all three all the time. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, let's start out with just with your background. You grew up in Chicago. I know your uh, your mom was a teacher. Your dad was a doctor. Um, tell us a little bit about the early years in Chicago. Sure. Well, first, if you if I can just take a moment, I just want to thank you so much for hosting this conversation. Uh, I'm so honored. Uh, we all know that Senator uh, Simon was uh, not just a legend in politics, but he certainly had a national footprint. And on today, uh, as we know that uh, John Lewis was laid to rest, I think about both uh, Senator Paul Simon, I think about Congressman John Lewis, and I think of the impact that they had on my own view about public service and really uh, just having a real heart and compassion for the people that they are served. Uh, that they serve. So I'm, I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, I also just want to say that growing up in Chicago, you know, I'm from the south side of Chicago, the Bronzeville community. And the first office that I really ran for was as local school council representative for the high school that I attended as well as my daughters attended. And so um, I started uh, just wanting to make sure that I could really be an advocate for public school. And so I ran for a uh, local school council representative. That election required me to stand outside of the gym for about one day with about $35 worth of, of uh, flyers saying, vote for me for local school council representative. And I did that and was successful and then went on to um, uh, you know, serve as the local school council parent rep as well as the chair of that council. Uh, it was a great introduction to understand how uh, being elected to an office and really listening to the people that you represent is a great way to uh, create and effectuate real change in your community. And, uh, you know, at a time when our public school systems were being so challenged, it was important for me to be an advocate uh, for the parents, but also for the students who were in that public school, who uh, we was a neighborhood school and wanting to make sure that 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 would continue. And so that was kind of how it started. I, I'm a lawyer by background. Um, I uh, went to DePaul University College of Law. Uh, while I was in law school, I was trained in uh, as a mediator by the uh, Center for Conflict Resolution. I really fell in love with that process. The idea that yes, as a lawyer, I could be a strong advocate and I could argue very well, trust me, but I love the idea of really bringing people together to solve problems and to think about what does it mean when you have people who might be on two different sides of an issue, uh, but bringing them together to say, is there a way that we can think about what the underlying needs and interests are and seeing if there's a way we can come to some resolution without going to court. And that's how I spent about 20 years with my own firm uh, doing alternative dispute resolution, mediation, arbitration, and serving as an administrative judge. Um, from there, what that led me to was um, uh, working with uh, the Cook County Board President and leading her Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative, 
uh, I'm sorry, leading the Justice Advisory Council. I'm now working with the Justice Equity and Opportunity Initiative. And we were working on how do you reduce the populations at the Cook County Jail and the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center, uh, which had, um, had really just ballooned due to mass incarceration. And how do we really help people see more alternatives in communities because uh, mass incarceration causes so much destruction to so many communities, disproportionately Black and Latino communities. And so I did that work and that then kind of led me um, ultimately to the University of Illinois where I led the Center for uh, Public Safety and Justice. And I worked with law enforcement, uh, which of course now is there's a, a lot of discussion about what needs to happen to increase police accountability. So all of those were things that I did uh, starting here in Chicago that kind of led me to ultimately run for a uh, state representative and now serving as Lieutenant Governor. When you were doing a, a mediation, how would it typically work? I mean, would you have a sense of where this dispute should be resolved and you kind of nudge the parties in that direction? Or what is the technique by which you bring, uh, bring the parties to a, a common place? Most of the mediations that I did were for governmental agencies. I did do some uh, with private mediation, but I worked at the federal, state, and uh, city level on, uh, with primarily relating to employment discrimination. One of the contracts I had, for example, was with the United States Postal Service. Uh, in winning, any time that there was a claim of discrimination, then I could sit down and meet with the employer uh, excuse me, the employee, as well as the, the management representative. Um, and so the process was really just saying, first of all, tell me your perspective, your side of the story. And I use that terms. What's your side of the story? Because in any conflict, there are two sides of a story and people have their own perspective because they're bringing their own lens and their own life experience to that that uh, conflict. After hearing that, I would try to identify what were some common points that we needed to talk about and basically set an agenda for that meeting. I didn't really come to those meetings with my own idea of what the outcome should be. I wanted to hear from both sides what they thought the outcome should be. And then after drafting the agenda, we would start working to, to where I would kind of use different techniques to help them listen to each other better. What I have found, and I think it was the same while I was a mediator, it exists right now in the political world. Oftentimes, uh, what's firstly, what's firstly uh, of mind in terms of importance is the ability to be heard. There are so many people, and, and this idea that we have right now as uh, sort of as we think about civil discourse and we think about the fact that so, so many things in the political world have become so contentious and so divisive, what people often need is an opportunity to be heard and creating space for that to happen. And that's what I did as a mediator. I, I created a room. There were think, ways that I set up the room. We didn't sit across from each other. We sat at round tables. We wanted to make sure that everybody would have equal space and time to talk. And that's what I did to try to get them to whatever they believed was the best outcome, not what I believed. Now, as I served as an arbitrator, of course, there I was making a decision. But as a mediator, it was about what did the parties want? And I think right now, uh, as a policymaker, and for those who are on uh, part of this call who are policymakers and interested in policymaking, uh, that's what's really important. I can't bring my own, I have my own ideas, of course, of things that I would like to see happen. The governor and I, of course, had an agenda and things that we ran on as a platform. But what do the people of our state, what are the things that they are saying is important and how do we listen better so that people realize that they have the opportunity to be heard? Well, tell us what it's like, what it was like to be a state representative uh, in terms of, you know, entering Springfield and having these welter of disparate voices, uh, fairly sharp, uh, sharply partisan environment. Tell us what it was like to enter that world and what you tried to accomplish while you were in, in the General Assembly. What I knew in coming to the General Assembly uh, was that I was going to bring my full self to that role. And part of that was bringing my expertise as a mediator. Um, I knew that uh, at the time, it was a very 
again, yes, it was a very contentious time. There was, uh, uh, you know, along partisan lines, there was a lot of division, not a lot of, and I don't mean personally, because of course people built personal relationships, but as it came to getting on that floor and having to make decisions, uh, you, did, you often did not see the level of bipartisanship on some of the bigger issues that you would like to see. We were all colleagues and we were all friendly with each other and collegial as colleagues, but, um, but there were often some times that you really wondered and people of Illinois wondered, was anything going to get done? And so it was a difficult time from that standpoint. What I did was, uh, first of all, I recognized that uh, there were many people, I, I'm a Democrat and I recognize that many people from my party, we, we had a number of issues that we were on the same side on. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I listened and spent a lot of time building relationship with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. That was important to me. It was important to understand uh, why they saw things very differently than I did as somebody who is from the south side of Chicago and have lived here most of my life. Uh, Illinois is a big state. It is a diverse state. Uh, and I recognized that each person was representing their district to the best of their ability based upon the demographics that they served. And so it wasn't really my point to come in. Uh, there were some points that, of course, I disagreed philosophically about uh, some of the things that were said, but, but, it, but it wasn't my point to come in and be disagreeable, even though we might disagree. It was to understand and to figure out where we could find points of consensus. Criminal justice reform has been something that has been important to me. Uh, I'm a restorative justice practitioner, uh, have been for probably two decades, uh, and uh, came into the, the Illinois House of, Representative, uh, House of Representatives with a strong passion for uh, working on issues related to criminal justice reform and juvenile justice reform. And that's exactly what I did. Because I had had conversations with so many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and spent time getting to know them, even though it was not probably something that was expected, most of the bills, not all, but most of the bills that I filed uh, passed unanimously, especially around the criminal justice reform issues. And that came by talking through, people's, uh, th through people who might not have been likely allies. So I... Uh, passed a bill to end school-based booking stations in the state. I passed a bill to end preschool expulsion in the state of Illinois and passed the first ever Women's Correctional Services Act, which uh, really focused on how do we um, create gender responsive and trauma-informed women's corrections in our state. And finally, the uh, one of the bills that I was most uh, proud of was to allow for uh, voting in jails, uh, which People who are in jails have not been convicted. They still should have the right to vote, but they weren't given that opportunity in most jails throughout our state. And so I got that bill passed. It was vetoed by the previous governor, uh, but I was fortunate to help uh, it push through and Governor Pritzker signed that bill into law. But all of those bills required uh, some level of bipartisan support, and I was glad to work in that capacity. Could you explain the concept of restorative justice? I know you, you refer to it in your speeches and talks and so forth. What does it mean to you? So restorative justice uh, is not a new concept. Uh, indigenous people from the very beginning and continuing to this day have recognized that as a conflict comes up or a problem comes up in their community or in their tribe or in their village, however we describe it, in their community, uh, there was not a need to go outside of that village or that tribe or the community to find a solution. They would bring those from the community, particularly the elders, to come together and continue to do that during, to, even today, as I've connected with the indigenous populations in Illinois, bring them together to say, we can solve these problems on our own. Uh, we don't have to go outside to seek the solutions what we often say in the restorative justice world is that the wisdom is in the room. It means that everything that we need to solve the challenges, even I say today, the challenges of our state are found right here in the communities in our state. What we have to do is create the space, much like I did as a mediator, to listen to one another and recognize that the solutions are in fact here. 
We have some grave challenges in our state, but I also believe in the people of our state. And as we listen and recognize that in our diversity, we can still find the strength of what makes Illinois uh, just such a, a wonderful place to be and a wonderful place to live, work, and play. Uh, and it's really about uh, what I see as my role in bringing a restorative justice lens to my role as Lieutenant Governor to say, how do I spend more of my time listening as we try to solve these problems and not thinking that it's just people in elected office who have all the solutions? We, we do have to have solutions for our state. They must be informed by the wisdom that is found in every community in our state. I, I was struck in your in inaugural remarks. You, you talked uh, a lot about the notion of community, uh, both in, in Illinois as, a, as, a, as one community. Um, you know, it, it, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, how many Illinois are there? Are there one Illinois? Is it two Illinois? Are there six Illinois? Tell us about your sense of Illinois as a single coherent community. Well, I think, first of all, I'll say that it, it goes without saying that we know, as I mentioned before, that there's a lot of diversity in the state. Most of Illinois uh, is rural. We know that agriculture is our number one industry. Uh, we know that people have different, um, from p different political persuasions and lots of different perspectives on issue, and that has been abundantly clear uh, during this era of COVID-19. Um, and so I'm not going to sugarcoat and say that everybody is just on the same page on every single issue. That, of course, is not the case. But I've spent a lot of time traveling the state, and i um, I recognized, for example, as the chair of the Governor's Rural Affairs Council, that I could not fully understand the needs and the issues of our rural communities without going to our rural communities and listening to people from our rural communities. I spend a lot of time in both Central and Southern Illinois talking to people and understanding the issues in those parts of the state. What I will say is that more connects us than divides us. And even though there might be certain issues that come up and we see it in the news and, and, and people are protesting and saying, well, we don't like what's happening here. Or we don't like the decisions the administration is making. Um, at the same time, there's so much more that, that brings us together and connects us. I say all the time, for example, that agriculture connects us all. And so I'm using my role to try to figure out how can we bring to people together around agriculture, the fact that all throughout our state, agriculture and food, and how do we connect around that? I think about some of the issues such as uh, broadband internet access, and the fact that when we talk about connecting every corner of our state, that yes, there are lots of rural communities where we need to expand broadband access, but there are also communities on the south and west sides of Chicago that need broadband internet access. So what I think needs to happen is our understanding where do we find commonality in some of these issues and finding our strength and talking about these issues because we all can get a lot farther and have a bigger impact when we talk about them together. So I don't, I, I of course see us as one Illinois and I think especially during COVID, um, even though there might be some dissenting voices about some of the things that we need to do, I think this has been a time over the last five months that we've seen people come together all across the state like never before. And when you have a global pandemic and you have a virus that you can't see, it's a novel coronavirus, something we've never seen before, but I can't think of anything that was more important than to recognize that we are all in this together and that the only way that we'll be able to move forward is by coming together as a state. Well, let's talk a little bit about the position of lieutenant governor. Um, Sheila Simon wrote a really wonderful paper on the, the position of the lieutenant governor a few years ago for the Institute. And she made the point that um, there are a, a series of statutory responsibilities, which are kind of disparate ones. I, I'd love to hear the history of things from the Illinois Rivers Commission to yes. military and uh, base economic development. And rural affairs right. Council. So there's you know, an array of statutory responsibilities. But then she also makes the point that each lieutenant governor tries to put his or her own imprint in terms of personal interests and, and the office has a convening power and an ability to attract interest. So uh, tell us a little bit about how, how those two realms um, shape your day-to-day -day work, the statutory and then the personal issues that you're, you're passionate about. 
Well, let me just say that uh, it's one of the things, and I'm sure uh, that she would perhaps would agree, it's one of the things that is most fascinating and a lot of uh, fun uh, is that the, about this role, and that is the creativity that you can have in terms of, yes, you have these statutory responsibilities, but you can also identify some things that you're passionate about and do this work. Um, so statutorily, and you've mentioned them, I chair the Governor's Rural Affairs Council, I chair the um, uh, Rivers Council, I chair the Military Economic Development Council. One new council, uh, since she served as Lieutenant Governor, is the uh, Illinois Council on Women and Girls, and I am the first chair of that council. It was established legislatively, uh, I believe, two years ago, and so I'm now serving as that chair as the per the governor's appointment. I also serve on a council, uh, really a steering committee around opioid uh, uh, use disorders and trying to bring an equity lens to that work. Um, another thing that has been added statutorily relates to the adult use cannabis legislation. As you know, we uh, worked very hard to make sure that here in Illinois, we had the most equity centric adult use cannabis legislation in the entire nation. And one reason that it is uh, the most adult, uh, excuse me, equity centric legislation is because it includes something that many people from uh, communities all throughout the state, uh, particularly black and brown communities that had been disproportionately harmed by the failed war on drugs that they fought for and lifted their voices and said they wanted to make sure it was built directly into the legislation. And then of course the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus also was a strong advocate and proponent to make sure that what's called the Restore, Reinvest and Renew um, Board was created. Now, the Restore, Reinvest, and Renew Board, uh, I chair that board. Again, that's another statutory responsibility that I have. And it, uh, the R3 program uh, uh, makes sure that 25% of the net tax revenue that is brought in through the adult use cannabis uh, sales is reinvested into the communities that have been most harmed by the war on drugs. And uh, there's five different categories of funding. It includes everything from economic development, youth development, uh, uh, civil legal aid, reentry services for those that are exiting the Department of Corrections, as well as, um, uh, I'm missing one, civil legal aid. Well, uh, it, it'll come to me. Violence prevention. I don't think I said that. Violence prevention. These are all critically important. They are certainly coming up in this time that all across the nation and the globe, people are calling for racial justice. And we are doing that work. We are bringing more justice to these communities. So this is a board that I chair. Uh, and this is work that's all on the statutory side. I'm passionate about all of these committees and we're doing great work with all of these committees and councils. On the other side, uh, Governor Pritzker, uh, when he asked me to be his running mate, I told him, look, something that I've worked on as a restorative justice practitioner and just and something that I was interested in throughout my life is criminal justice reform and juvenile justice reform. And I really want to have a, a key role in working on those issues in the administration. And his response was, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, shortly after we were inaugurated, he established by executive order what's called the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative. And the way that I describe our work with what we call the JEO is that um, the conversation around justice can never be just about policing jails and prisons. For too long, that was the conversation. Policing, jails, prisons, that is criminal justice reform. What I would say justice reform is about is about access to affordable housing. Justice reform is about access to health care, including mental health care and trauma-informed care. Justice is about food justice and access to food and nutritious food in every community and addressing issues of food insecurity. Justice is about education and pipelines to uh, educational and uh, economic opportunity. These are all the kinds of things that come up, our environment. These are issues relating to justice. And I'm helping to, through this JEO role, and we have a director, Quinn Rollins, who leads that initiative, but, and it's housed in my office. We are working to make sure our agencies and departments throughout the state, as well as when we think about criminal justice reform, that we are really thinking in, with real intentionality around how do we build strong communities? Because when we have healthy communities, 
You don't see people being funneled into the criminal justice system on a mass level like we have in the past. When we have healthy communities, you see communities that are thriving with small businesses and access to all the things that anyone would need to survive and to thrive. So um, that's just an example of some of the work that we've been doing. And if I can just take one moment to mention one more. My mother, uh, Velma, died of Alzheimer's disease in 2016. And I was her primary caregiver. And when I became the uh, Lieutenant Governor, one of the things that I wanted to do is I recognized that there were many people throughout the state who also had a family member who might have been in the same role that I was as caregiver. So we started a, a campaign called Through Our Eyes to focus on caregivers and how to better resource um, our state around uh, Alzheimer's dementia, Alzheimer's related dementia and caregiving and how to better support caregivers. It was, it's a stressful thing to be a caregiver. I know some of the people who are probably on this call have experienced that. Uh, I'd do it again in a heartbeat if I could, but um, we talked about how in rural communities, for example, where you might not be one town away from a hospital, you might be two or three towns away from a hospital. So we met with community, uh, met with caregivers in rural communities. We met with caregivers in communities of color where they had different experiences about accessing some of the latest uh, treatments and, and resources. I met with people with early onset Alzheimer's who were 40 and 50 years old and already had been diagnosed. And the bottom line is, is that uh, this was something that I was able to do, and now we are going to work on policy and legislative solutions to make Illinois a dementia-capable state. These are the kinds of things that I am able to do as lieutenant governor, and I spend every day working on these issues. Well, tell us about the mechanics of the office. Uh, I know you have an office in the Capitol. I'm sure you have one in Chicago. Do you and the governor, I mean, do you have sort of a regular check-in, weekly check-in, or what is the, I mean, how do you integrate your programs with what the governor is, is working on? Yeah, so first and foremost, um, our teams are in constant communication, and the governor and I are in constant communication. Uh, and then we have sort of these joint team meetings on a regular basis to, you know, every week there's, there's joint team meetings that the governor and I are often on those meetings, a part of those meetings as well. Um, but the way that things are integrated is really through just keeping the lines of communication open. Um, the governor, as you know, there's also four deputy governors and all of us have a different portfolio that we are leading. Um, my portfolio, uh, of course, includes many of the agencies that relate to justice reform, because that is the thing that I am helping to lead for the administration, in addition to my statutory responsibilities. And so there are certain departments and agencies that we work very closely with, but certainly have to partner and make sure that we're all in alignment and on the same page. And that goes with every aspect. So as we're working on, uh, you know, what's happening with the legislative agenda, with the policy agenda, uh, our teams are working very closely on those efforts. Um, right now, for example, as we are, had to, are continuing to work through these issues of COVID-19, this has required really all hands on deck throughout the administration. And so uh, that has required some real intensity around, yes, we're gonna keep everything else going, but this is a global pandemic and we have to make sure that we are all on the same page to do whatever we can to save lives and reduce the spread. So we work in, in close quarters. And I think one of the things that I always appreciate, people do acknowledge and can tell how much the governor and I enjoy working with each other. Uh, we, we, of course, had a great time on the campaign, uh, but we just really, um, you know, I so respect his leadership and his style of leadership. And we just have a great working relationship, which I really appreciate. Well, you, you've mentioned COVID a few times and, and wonder if you could tell us where you think things stand. I mean, the governor came out very strong in March and, and took some precautions that he got some heat for, but now I guess in retrospect look like they were prescient in terms of being very careful and, and then opening the state up in a slow way, dividing it into 11 districts, I think. Um, but now, I think even yesterday, he said he's concerned that there might be some backsliding occurring. Where do you see things stand? How do you think things stand right now? Well, I think the first and foremost, I want to say, um, just often, I have to just pause periodically because we have lost 100 and, 
over 150,000 Americans uh, in, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And when I think about that level of death, it's hard to talk about it without pausing to just recognize the lives lost. And with that, there's been over 7,400 members of our Illinois family that we have lost to COVID-19. And that's just a stunning number. And uh, I know that because I've known people that have uh, died due to COVID-19, I always say that when we have a, a communication like this or a Zoom call or another call like this where many people have joined, there are others who have this has impacted directly. And so I wanna just acknowledge that and uh, recognize the humanity behind these numbers, that it's not just numbers, these are uh, husbands and wives and spouses and you know, daughters and sons and siblings, coworkers and neighbors. And I just have to say that. Having said that, I, I also wanna say how proud I am of Governor Pritzker's leadership, who without really any direction from the federal government was able to really kind of get right to work to think about, you know, what do we need to do for, for testing and being one of the first states to really push testing and getting our testing numbers up, uh, to have to go after and find uh, PPE and make sure that we had the personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers and others who are on the front lines, all of our essential workers. And to make some really, really tough decisions in the face of a pandemic of a virus that no one knew anything about. We didn't know what to expect. And so, um, to, of course, we had that rise. We saw the curve flatten and then begin to decline. And when I think about where we are right now, where we have some surrounding states with three to four times the positivity rate, boy, am I grateful for the leadership of our governor who took it seriously, who said from the very beginning that we were going to follow the data and the science and we were going to listen to the experts and the epidemiologists to make the best decisions to save lives here in our state. Where are we now is what you asked. And what I would say is that um, we are at a place where, as the governor has said, we're not headed in the right direction. We had been sort of at this steady about 2.7% uh, positivity rate uh, for a number of weeks and, and, and you know, felt that we were in a good place and really kept that message going about let's keep going. The virus is still out here. Let's do what we need to do as Illinoisans. Uh, and as we hit phase four and people are in contact more, um, we have seen uh, an increase. And I think right now the positivity rate is uh, like a seven day sort of um, rolling positivity rate, I think is somewhere around 3.8% now. So that's not heading in the direction that we'd like to see. Um, there are certain hot spots. We, the governor broke the uh, regions down to now 11 different regions. And we see a couple of areas where we are seeing uh, those numbers getting up there. And as the governor has said, if he needs to go back, based upon the data, of course, and bring some more restrictions that that could happen. But we certainly are looking for our local units of government to do everything they can to make sure that they are putting the kinds of restrictions in place that can uh, get us to the place where we need to be. Nobody wants to go back. We know the impact that it has had on so many families, this pandemic, as well as our business community. So none of us want to go back, but right now, if we see those numbers going up, we'll have to do what we have to do. Right. Issue, uh, obviously, less <laughs> important than the, than the human factor. Obviously, there's been great economic distress. I mean, the federal government came out with, you know, shocking numbers of the economy contracting as deeply as it ever has in its history. How do you see the, the sort of state of the, the Illinois economy now? Well, clearly, like every single other nation, in, excuse me, every other state in the nation, clearly this has been a hit. You know, we were able to pass a balanced budget in our first term and had uh, just such optimism about the direction that our state was headed and the things that we wanted to put in place and where we wanted to go. And then this global pandemic hits, which, hit, which um, just had catastrophic impact on just every level of government and our finances, of course. Um, I think one of the things that we have been very clear is that we have to take care of the people of Illinois and make sure that we 
are not balancing any budget on the backs of the most vulnerable people of our state. And this pandemic has certainly highlighted the vulnerabilities that exist in communities all throughout our state. Um, and so, you know, there's some tough decisions that have to, had to be made, um, but mostly we are going to continue to do what we need to do to support the most vulnerable families and people in our state. So uh, we certainly have needed help from the federal government. We've appreciated the help that we have received. We need more. Uh, that's something that we continue to advocate for to make sure that the people of Illinois have what they need, including um, our small business owners. Um, we've been able to do some some uh, innovative things with our Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity to make sure that we could support uh, businesses, businesses that had been devastated or had their business uh, interrupted due to COVID-19 and by providing $60 million in grant money that can go to them to really help them kind of spur the economy more. Uh, and also looking at other kinds of support systems that can be provided to families all across our state so that they can get things going again and make sure that they have what they need. But clearly it's been difficult. Uh, I think that, you know, as we continue to talk about the need to do those three W's that Dr. Zike talks about who leads our Department of Public Health, which is washing our hands, wearing a mask and watching our, our physical distance, um, I think what's important is that, you know, wearing a mask is, we know that that uh, reduces the spread of COVID-19 per the studies by about 80%. And that's something that if we all would just do, it could help us make sure that businesses can stay open uh, as that spread, is that, you know, to, as we keep this uh, virus from spreading. But we all have to do our part. And, that, and I think that's the link that I hope everyone will make that, it's not a political statement about wearing a mask. It is really about if we're going to be in phase four and want to keep on the right path, because we're not going to have a, a vaccine for, you know, until 2021 sometime probably or end of 2020, but it's going to take a long time, as the governor has said, then we need to make sure that to support those businesses that we wear the mask so that the spread can stop. And that's just kind of where we are. Right. I think a lot of people maybe a year ago thought that this summer and fall would there be a really heavy focus on the constitutional amendment on the progressive income tax. You know, just given the circumstances, it seems like that debate has not really been publicly joined. How do you see that unfolding and how, how essential is the passage of this amendment to putting in a, a foundation for Illinois long term fiscal uh, soundness? Well, I think this is something that, you know, people will, you know, the people of Illinois will weigh in on, um, you know, and, and, and I think that's what's most important, that we will hear from the people in terms of what direction that they want to go. I think from the governor and I, our perspective is that we're going to continue to focus on, you know, under the circumstances, especially within the midst of this pandemic, we're going to focus on everything that we can do to continue to keep on the right path, but understanding the difficulties that certainly were raised by, by, by this pandemic. But that had always been the goal, to make sure that we could uh, address some of the structural needs that need to be changed in our state and making sure that we can uh, do whatever we can to, um, uh, you know, again, meet the needs of the people. And, and, and however it happens, we're going to be prepared to make sure that we work on the kind of budget that continues to, to show that government is here to help people, to help make sure that those who need government uh, resources and programs, that that is here to stay. We've been at a time where we did not have a budget in Illinois. And one of the things that the governor and I have said, regardless of whatever happens, uh, that we're always going to keep focusing on making sure we have a, a budget that we can work with to meet the needs of the people. Right. Well, Lieutenant Governor, we have some questions for you that people have sent in. And let me begin with Lorraine from Carbondale, who's wondering um, what, uh, how, this is probably beyond what you work with on a daily basis, but just the, the question of, of the federal government possibly sending military forces into Chicago and so forth. I mean, is that an issue that um, is something that you and the governor are monitoring, or do you have any just even general thoughts on, on that? that yeah, well, so of course that is uh, something that's more uh, from a standpoint of a local level. I think that the way that I look at that is that, 
you know, I do a lot of work around justice. You know, I talked about the Justice, Equity, and Opportunity Initiative. And right now, uh, and I think about, again, as I mentioned, uh, John Lewis at the very beginning, who um, I so admire, and he, I don't know, many of you might have seen the, uh, his opinion piece in the uh, New York Times today, uh, where he wrote a final letter to really all of us um, as he was on his deathbed and asked that it be uh, printed on the day of his funeral, which of course was today. The idea of protesting, especially right now, and it's happening every single day, whether the news is talking about it or not, protests are happening every single day, calling for equal justice under the law, calling for racial justice, and, uh, and people have a First Amendment right to protest, to lift up their voices, and to speak out against the injustices that we have seen in our country for far too long, and to speak out against uh, uh, police brutality, and to say that we are calling for police accountability. My particular take on this issue of you know, what, what has happened here in the, in the city of Chicago is that there was a discussion around uh, uh, federal resources, not necessarily troops coming into Illinois or coming into Chicago in particular, to help address the issue of violence. And um, what I will say, which is something that I have said all along, is that I know that we cannot police our way out of the issue of violence. Uh, we have to think about how do we invest in communities all throughout the state of Illinois, not just in Chicago, but in Peoria, in uh, Rockford, in Springfield, in Carroll, and other communities throughout the state where we've seen spikes in violence. And that is something that's going to require some real investment. We can no longer just focus on response to violence. We have to focus on prevention and intervention. So. Um, I think that there are some things that the federal government can do. Uh, there are some resources, some real resources and investments that can come from the federal government that can help communities uh, combat this issue and to really help create strong communities all throughout uh, the state of Illinois. Um, so I was, of course, horrified by what I saw in Portland. And I will continue to speak out about, against anything like that happening here in the state of Illinois and making it very clear that, uh, you know, that's unconstitutional of people getting grabbed and put into unmarked cars and no one knowing who that is that is grabbing them. That is wrong. It is unconstitutional, but most importantly, or as importantly, uh, it does not do anything for the cause of justice and it does not do anything for the cause of stopping violence. In fact, it's the kind of thing that uh, can help increase uh, and escalate the kinds of uh, the, what's happening during the protest. So that, that's my perspective on it. And, and uh, I'm hoping that we don't see any such thing here in Illinois and I will continue to monitor that as well. Well, dovetailing on that, we have a question from Gary in Carbondale, who, who, who wants to know your thoughts on, given your, your background in justice, criminal justice issues, your thoughts on community policing and the, 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 the term defunding the police. And he goes on to say, is the state working on any programs that cities like Carbondale could participate in to begin transforming the way we do policing? Well, I absolutely welcome Gary's uh, input, thoughts, and ideas, and others from Carbondale who want to be a part of this conversation. And I invite everyone, as the whole world is talking about police accountability now, I invite all, all of you to, to reach out to my office and to see, to share your ideas, uh, because this is an issue that affects every community, and it is an issue that we must address. Um, as we have this conversation, I speak the names of uh, George Floyd, and I speak the names of Breonna Taylor, and so many others of whom I probably could not even name given the, the short time that we have on this call. But I speak their names because it is clear that we cannot be in, live in a society where whole populations of people, Black people in particular, do not... Uh, trust that, it, that they can have interactions with the police and feel that it will be, or, or they fear having interactions with the police. Too many. 
you know, I did want to, I did a series of conversations around cultural trauma after, uh, you know, in response to this racial injustice. And I had my husband, who, by the way, is a Saluki, uh, my husband, Brian, who graduated from SIU Carbondale. And one of the questions, it was a, a conversation about black, mental, black men's mental health. And I asked him, you know, do you feel safe walking the streets? Do you feel safe as you think about what might happen with uh, interactions with the police? And my husband's answer was no, he doesn't. And I think about all of the people who don't feel safe. If we talk about um, and we see these incidents happening over and over, and if they are done and there is no level of accountability, then that is where the real issue is. And what I hear people calling for all across the state uh, and all across, not just across the state in small towns, not just in Chicago, but small towns across the state, but also across the country, where in every single state of our nation, there are, are uh, protests going on, is that not only do we need accountability, uh, but we need real investment. We need investment in our communities. You know, I talked about the R3 program and what we're doing there to invest in communities. But I think across the board, you know, there are communities that uh, when we think about systemic racism really being at the root of so many, much of the policies that have taken place throughout history, over 400 years of policies, whether it's education policy, economic policy, housing policy, uh, healthcare policy, we have seen the ugliness of systemic racism that really said that someone like me uh, should not have had access to opportunity, should not have had free access or equal access in those systems that would have allowed me to have the same right to opportunity as everyone else. And we see that in our policing structures as well. So we have to address what systemic racism is and what does it look like? How is it playing out? And it is playing out when we see unarmed black men and women being killed with impunity. And we have to address that and make sure there's accountability. But I think the other thing that we are hearing is that there needs to be investment, that we spend a lot of money responding through policing, but we don't do a lot invest of the kind of investment that's needed in communities and making sure that we are investing in these communities to make sure that they are healthy as I spoke of before. So uh, what I would say is that yes, I welcome your ideas and your thoughts on what we need to do. I think that we have a lot of young people that are leading the way in these protests and I for one as a restorative justice practitioner am committed to listening to the cries of the young people and what they are calling for. Uh, and then mostly just making sure that we don't just protest because I've been out there protesting as has Governor Pritzker, but that we also do the work, that we come back and say, it's not enough to just say this is wrong, that we do the work to make sure that what needs to happen and bring the, the right kinds of decisions to our policy making. That's the legacy of John Lewis, by the way, who said, when you see something is wrong, speak out. And the only thing that we can't do in this moment in time, in this moment in history, is be silent. And I think that's what's really important during this time. Susan of Effingham asks a question, who are your political heroes? You've mentioned John Lewis, of course, very yeah. fondly. I know uh, there's a certain president from Illinois who, uh, uh, who helped uh, wade in on your campaign in 2016. Presumably he's someone you feel good about. Are there other yeah. political heroes, mentors, people whose careers you particularly admire and maybe you weren't trying to emulate in some way? I love Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm, who was uh, the first black woman to head to Congress, the first black woman who was a uh, candidate for a major party nomination for president of the United States. Um, what I loved about her is that she talked a lot about the importance of uh, women in elected office, women being a part of the decision making as we think about the challenges in our communities and in our, in our uh, country. Uh, and there's a quote that I often repeat, and that is that she said that if they don't give you a seat at the table, then bring a folding chair. And I think about that often as the first black lieutenant governor in the state of Illinois' 201 year history that, you know, I, I've thought about it recently a lot. Like what, what is it that took 201 years for this moment to happen? 
what is behind that? And I think it's what's behind that is behind why we see so many other areas where people don't have a seat at the table. And so I so admired her decision to say, you know what, these seats, these seats that are a part of a conference, I, I kind of imagine for myself this conference room with these seats, and you know who sits at the head of the table, you know who sits at the other end. People kind of have these sort of uh, seats that are kind of set for them, they're set in stone. And then I imagine how many women, how many uh, people of color, how many black uh, and brown people, how many indigenous people, how many Asian people, how many LGBTQ people, how many people from communities uh, that are often not, who often feel forgotten, might have to say, including some of our rural communities, ha might have to say, you know what, you didn't invite me and you didn't make space for me, but I brought my own seat. And I'm going to sit at this table and I'm going to add my voice to our democracy and I'm gonna make sure that the issues of my community and the kinds of policies that need to be made that reflect my interest are included in this conversation. So I just see that and I, I try to do that. I try to include voices, but when I get to the table, I try not to be silenced. Uh, and I try not to uh, uh, shrink in those rooms. I try to bring, as I said before, my full self to the table because that's why I was elected uh, and, and I think that's what's important in this, in this particular time. Great. Well, as a final question, you had mentioned uh, in some of the uh, materials I've seen in interviews that you, uh, in terms of relaxing, I know you like to, to run, uh, you like to bike, I know you like concerts, uh, you enjoy documentaries. So if you, you have a, a, a free weekend or something, I mean, how do you unwind? What is fun and relaxing for you to, uh, to, uh, to decompress? Well, uh, I do try to, to get out quite a bit and exercise, uh, not as much for, uh, yes, for my physical health, but really for my mental health. I know that all of us have been under an added level of stress during COVID-19. And so I hope you all are, are practicing self-care and taking your care of yourself. You know, I like a good documentary. Uh, I want to recommend uh, uh, 13th which is Ava DuVernay's uh, film on the criminal justice system and really thinking about the 13th Amendment that says we cannot have involuntary servitude except under the circumstances where someone was convicted. And she makes the case that what we see through mass incarceration and we think about racial justice, uh, that racial justice lens of incarceration where disproportionately black and brown people are incarcerated, uh, arrested, detained and incarcerated and return to our communities with so many barriers. Uh, so I recommend that documentary 13. Uh, I'm gonna be watching uh, Beyonce tomorrow as she has her, uh, <laughs> her film, uh, because I think some, some people on this call may know I'm a big Beyonce fan. But I think it is important, by the way, as I mentioned that I like to dance and I like to, to, to get out into the community and I like nature. But I think that, you know, in this moment where we're pushing so hard for justice, we also have to find a place for joy. For people who are policymakers who are thinking about these challenges every single day and thinking about these really difficult issues, we also have to think about how are we gonna take care of ourselves so that we can be around to do the work that needs to happen. And so I think about that often. So I, I bring up those things that I like to do because I think it's, it's a way of my saying, you know, in a lot of ways, joy is a form of resistance. That to be able to find ways that we can continue to take care of ourselves and relax and laugh and connect with others and connect with friends and our family and still, sorry, still do the work that we have to do, uh, it's a balance because people out every single day if we're not taking care of ourselves, we're not gonna be able to sustain. And we have a lot of work that as policymakers that we're gonna to have to do together. And we need to be well to do that work. So I like to find ways to laugh and enjoy, enjoy good company. Great. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, so much for your time. It's been really a pleasure to be with you. And we look forward to you and your husband coming back to Southern Illinois when circumstances allow and he can see his old stomping ground. So thank you so much for your time and stay safe. Thank you. And say a thanks to all of you for joining us for another installment of Understanding Our New World series. 
continue to follow us on social media and thank you for supporting us, which allows us to keep the legacy of Paul Simon alive and well. Thank you so much.